think I think we can get started. You know, I you don't need much introductions. I'll let you, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, that's 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 helpful to us uh, to know uh, our invited uh, speakers a little bit about them, and that's usually for to motivate us and also the African students that uh, you advised last year and, and your experience uh, with that. And you were also at the African School of Physics in, uh, in Namibia in 2018, and you gave a lecture there. So you are familiar with uh, some of our students and some of our program at the African School of Physics. So on that note, I will just let you uh, take over. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I'm sorry for the tardiness. I, we were having some computer problems with the network, but um, in any case, my name is uh, Kathy Cutler. And um, what I wanted to kind of do is walk you through um, what got me to where I, where I am today in the beginning. Um, so I actually was born in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and I, I've shown you a map here uh, with, Ohio, with Ohio on it. And um, I grew up um, in a little town called Blanchester around there. And it's actually a very uh, rural area um, in Ohio. And we often joke that there's more animals there than there are people. Um, but now I, I, am, I work at Brookhaven, which is in the middle of Long Island. So for those of you who don't know, here's the um, United States and uh, you can see where New York is. And if you look past Pennsylvania, you can see that Ohio is right next to that. And um, I grew up in what's called the tri-state area, which is where Ohio was bounded by um, Indiana and Kentucky. And uh, I eventually moved from Ohio to go to uh, Missouri, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about. And Missouri is pretty much um, dab smack in the middle of the, of the United States. Actually, the central port is uh, located um, near Springfield. Uh, but I have spent the majority of my life actually um, in the middle of the country. One of the, the things that, that Ohio and the area that I grew up is, is known for is what are called the mounds. And these were uh, mounds that were actually built by the native indigenous people um, that were originally here. And uh, they were built for different reasons. Some of them um, were built to as burial mounds. Some were actually just built for um, to cover trash. And some were um, built um, just to um, have symbols. This is one of the most famous ones, which is called the uh, Serpent Mound, uh, which is very close to where I grew up. And actually my grandparents were the caretakers of, of this area. And it's a, a serpent um, with a um, egg in his mouth. And you can't really see this unless you're up um, pretty high. Uh, so I grew up around this and didn't really realize the importance until I went to school and uh, saw it in the history books. Um, but it's actually a very beautiful part of the country with uh, hills and farms and uh, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, so I uh, went to Blanchester High School. We were called Wildcats. Um, it was a really small school. Um, I graduated with about 100 people in my senior class. Um, from there, I decided to, to go to college and I ended up going to the University of Cincinnati. Um, I decided to go to a big city because I had grown up uh, in the country. And uh, there I got my bachelor's in biochemistry and then went on to get my PhD in inorganic chemistry. Um, I left there and took a position at Washington University. I worked at their um, hospital in the Mallinckrodt Institute of Radiology, uh, mostly working on cyclotron production of uh, um, isotopes for imaging. And then I accepted a position at the University of Missouri Research Reactor where I worked for quite some time and then left there um, to come to Brookhaven. So this is a, a picture of the University of Cincinnati. When I originally went there, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I started out in engineering and they had a great engineering program and once you would um, go to school part year and then work part year at a company and I thought that would give me a lot of experience. Um, but it turns out that I really wasn't that fond of engineering. Um, and so I ended up uh, changing my degree and went into chemistry. And if you look on this picture, you can see a really tall building that looks like a nail. And that's uh, where the chemistry department is. And so I spent a lot of time um, in that building um, getting my degree. Um, from there, I went to uh, Washington uh, University. 
And um, at that time, there was a Michael Welch was there, and he is uh, very well known. He actually did his postdoc here at Brookhaven, and he was a hot atom chemist, and then accepted the position at Washington University and really built up the program. Um, so I, I went there to really kind of uh, learn about cyclotron production and worked on developing methods for uh, radionuclides such as copper 64 and did a lot of my work actually on gallium 68. And um, then um, an offer came from uh, the University of Missouri and um, I decided to um, move on. Um, and so this is a, a picture actually looking at the reactor. And you can look down and see the, the Cherenkov radiation, the blue glow. Um, I'm actually standing on what is called the bridge um, with some of my collaborators. We've done um, a lot of work on uh, nanoparticles trying to incorporate radioisotopes for um, imaging and therapy. And uh, I can never quite, um, I always enjoy looking into um, the reactor and seeing this glow. And you can see some of the um, samples that are down there. And then the core is actually up in the middle there. So I worked at the University of Missouri um, for close to 20 years um, before I decided to come um, actually to Brookhaven. And I came to Brookhaven because I was interested in their ability to do, to do alpha emitters. And I um, felt that that might, uh, I couldn't do that at the University of Missouri. So actually I came here. Um, so I, as I said, when I grew up on a farm, I actually went back to, to school in the city. And then when I lived in St. Louis, I was in the city and going to the University of Missouri actually allowed me to get back to the country. Um, I've always loved animals and one of the things I really like are goats. So for um, some time we raised goats. Um, this is one of the, the babies um, that we had raised. And I have uh, four children, they're adults now um, and off doing their own thing. But here's kind of a picture of three of them um, when we were help they were actually helping me with some of the goats. Um, one of the things that we enjoy is fishing. We actually, my husband built a pond. This is my husband with uh, three of our kids. This is my hand here, helping them um, get out of the water. Uh, so it was a great place to uh, raise our kids and uh, um, go through that. So I enjoyed um, um, my time in Columbia. So um, when I was there, the, the opportunity rose to come to Brookhaven. And I had actually uh, worked with researchers at Brookhaven, um, particularly Suresh Srivastava and Leonard Mausner when I was doing my graduate work at the University of Cincinnati. And I was interested in looking at uh, radionuclides and their biological properties and how um, that uh, influenced how the compounds were taken up. And many of the, the radionuclides I needed, you could only uh, make at Brookhaven National Laboratory. So I, I met them there. So I was uh, familiar with the lab before I came here. And so when the opportunity was offered to come here, I kind of jumped at it to come and uh, help lead the program. But one of the, the things that most people don't realize is really the role that the Department of Energy has played and in utilizing um, many of their facilities that were originally designed um, to help with physics studies um, to develop radioisotopes um, that are used across the nation for a variety of applications. And Brookhaven, I would argue, has played in, in essence one of the largest roles in this. So Brookhaven was really responsible for developing the Molly Tech generator. And uh, they um, developed this principle of a generator, which is allows you to complex a parent isotope, which then decays to the daughter isotope, uh, which is of interest uh, for incorporation into compounds that can be used for medical imaging. And uh, they developed this, actually they were, they were looking at an iodine um, generator and found an impurity, which was the Molly 99, and isolated it and realized that the technetium had ideal properties uh, for imaging. So they went on to develop this, which was done by Walter Tucker and Margaret Green. And then Pal Richards uh, really promoted its use in nuclear medicine. Uh, further, they developed the, the glucose labeled molecule called FTG um, with fluorine 18. And this is used for um, measuring differences in metabolism. So there's a number of disease states or cancer that you can um, imaging changes with FDG, and it's the most prevalently used positron emission tomography agent 
um, in nuclear medicine. So both of these um, actually came from Brookhaven. But all the national labs have been involved at some level on developing radionuclides um, that played a heavy role uh, in nuclear medicine from imaging on to now what we're really interested in um, is therapy. So iodine-131 came from Lawrence Berkeley. It was really the first new nuclide that was um, developed and went onto the market pretty quickly and it's used for the ablation of thyroid cancer. And now there's a lot of interest actually in um, alpha emitters, um, which I'll talk to you a little bit more now. So the, the isotope program um, reports up through the Department of Energy and it was until recently under the nuclear physics umbrella, um, but it's now um, been moved over to a new program con called engineering and technology. And the mandate for the program is that it produce and distribute uh, radionuclides in which there, there is a demand that's not being met by the commercial sector. Uh, so we don't really wanna compete with companies, um, but we want to develop products that there is a need and then go on to supply them using our uh, unique facilities. Um, another mandate is to maintain these unique facilities and help upgrade them as needed uh, to enhance what we're able to provide under this mandate. And then finally, to do uh, research and development to develop new and isotopes that are of interest um, to improve processing um, methods um, to develop the isotopes for the future. And then at the, at the bottom here, the, another important um, focus that we do is we develop workforce development. So in the US, it, it used to be back in the 40s and 50s that a number of the universities um, had programs to help um, train um, students in nuclear and radiochemistry. A lot of those programs have shut down and there's a shortage of people who have this background, but the demand is growing. Uh, so what we are, are trying to do is to open our facilities and allow students and faculty um, to come here and develop this expertise so that they can actually go out and fill the needs of the workforce. And so and, uh, this is just a, a picture from last summer. I didn't really talk a lot about the research, um, but the group did to, uh, support um, a number of faculty, you see Jennifer Schusterman, um, Melissa Derry, and then um, a large number of students who came in and worked um, with automation, um, new generator designs, um, working with uh, Radcon, who we here came in and uh, really developed some Funk analysis to help inform how we're going forward with the cyclotron. Um, I did get to talk about this, but um, this is a significant part of our mission. So I'm not sure if everyone um, understands how the, the isotope program works, but um, there's actually a, a committee that directs us as to what the priorities are that we're supposed to work on. And this is called the, the NSAC program, which is the National Science Academy. And they meet periodically and they set down what um, the focus of the program should be for the next few years. The last time they met, um, they indicated that there needed to be an increase in research and support for the facilities and that we should focus on making alpha emitting isotopes because there was a huge interest, but they weren't available, uh, particularly actinium-225, acetine-211, and lead-212. And the interest in these is for treating metastatic cancer. Uh, further, they, they recommended that we work on what are called theragnostics. And theragnostics are isotope pairs um, that can be used for uh, um, basically guiding personalized medicine. So you have an imaging isotope that you can use to image the patient um, to inform how the patient takes up the drug and what the dose will be. And then, in, and then based on that, you can determine what radionuclide to use for the ther therapy and in what dose to give. And nuclear medicine is really one of the few areas that actually um, provides such tailored um, options for treating patients. And then additionally develop um, targetry for harsh conditions and then increase basic R&D. And then for being out in particular, they wanted us to increase our beam intensity and consider adding a second beam line. 
So this, this is a, a map that shows you um, the different sites that fall under the isotope program. There's about seven uh, different national laboratories uh, that report under the isotope program and utilize their unique facilities um, to provide isotopes. And you can see them listed on here um, with the isotopes that they can provide. Um, I'm at Brookhaven and we work um, as a joint facility with Los Alamos um, to provide isotopes year round, um, mostly for medical applications, but also for industrial and environmental um, applications. And there are universities that are now joining the program and work to help provide um, services as well as isotopes to the program. So the isotope program university network was um, started probably about three years ago. And uh, the universities have uh, unique uh, facilities that can also produce isotopes, um, often at a lower cost than the national labs can. And on here, I've, I've highlighted two of these programs. Um, one is the University of Washington in Seattle. They have a scanatronic um, cyclotron, uh, which um, supplies alpha protons and deuterons up to about 50 MeV. Uh, and this is the only cyclotron that can go up to uh, 50 MeV that's outside of the national labs in the US. Uh, and they came on the program. Um, they joined, they were the first university to join the program. And the interest really was uh, for producing astatine 211 uh, regionally for the program. There's a limited number of cyclotrons in the US that can do this. And it has a really short half-life, so it has to be done on a regional basis. Um, the other, uh, the second university to join the program was the University of Missouri. And uh, they have a research reactor um, that is the most uh, prolific isotope producer actually in the United States. And so they joined the program um, to really um, provide uh, uh, neutron produced radioisotopes. Um, the first one that was really of interest was selenium 75, uh, but then they go on um, actually to provide uh, lutetium 177, which was actually an isotope that I developed when I was um, at, there at the university. So the isotope program um, has a business office that operates um, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory that's called the NIDC which stands for the National Isotope Development Center. And this is, uh, was actually set up and enables them to work with external customers and develop a production schedule and then basically accept money um, to provide isotopes. So we are mandated uh, by Congress uh, um, to provide isotopes that are not available. So if there's a shortage, uh, we need to step up and provide it. And we do this actually through the NIDC. So we're kind of like a small business that actually works through the Department of Energy, um, which is uh, very unique for the Department of Energy. And uh, um, so we, we not only do R&D, but we actually have schedules and things that we need to meet. So through, through the isotope program, there are accelerator facilities that report through this. And um, these accelerators are very unique in that they operate at very high energies. And the three um, accelerators out that I'll talk a little bit about is the one at, at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And uh, this is built on the linear accelerator that was originally designed um, to deliver protons to the RIC program. Uh, but it had had excess capacity and it was expanded um, to deliver protons for isotope production. And it also delivers protons um, to the NASA facility to look at the impacts of um, dose on, on a variety of different applications. Then there's the Los Alamos uh, facility that was uh, built later, and it was built largely based on the design of the Brookhaven facility that was built first. And we run these programs um, together to make sure that we can produce isotopes year round. One of the newest accelerator facilities that joined the program was the facility at Argonne and the LEAF facility, which is a low energy accelerator facility. And they use electrons to bombard targets um, to produce isotopes. And there are certain isotopes that have much higher cross sections um, with the electron and linear accelerator. And uh, so they can produce them in higher amounts than we can with protons. And so at the top here, you can actually see the, uh, this is the hot cell facility at Brookhaven. 
And then um, in the middle is the hot cell facility, um, actually at uh, Los Alamos. And at the bottom is a hot cell facility at Argonne National Laboratory. Now, the isotopes that um, we can produce um, are supplied for a number of different applications. Um, one of the large ones is actually for medical applications. So Los Alamos and Brookhaven um, produce strontium-82, um, which decays to rubidium-82 and is used for imaging coronary artery disease. And uh, this is used in hundreds of thousands of patients each year and is one of the ideal isotopes actually used for this application. We also um, produce isotopes that are used as environmental tracers, such as selenium-75 and silicon-32. And then um, we provide isotopes um, also, as I said, for a lot of theranostics. And here you see an image of a patient in which an isotope is being used um, to image metastatic disease. And this enables them to quantitate the disease and then to inform how, what therapy the doctor should use. And then there are sources that we uh, produce that are actually used for calibrating instrumentation, such as sodium-22 for calibrating um, positron emission tomography cameras, and then cadmium-109 that is used as a, a source for x-ray fluorescence. Um, so here um, we can talk about the Brookhaven National Laboratory in the top picture. Um, you actually see an outline of the Collider Accelerator Department at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And if you look closely, um, you'll see a red line and at the top of that is the linear accelerator that can produce protons up to 200 MeV. And then the blue shown at the bottom is actually the blip. Um, which is the Brookhaven Lenac Isotope Production Facility, uh, which was designed solely to accept uh, protons to irradiate targets. So the only thing we do there really is irradiate targets. And then once those targets uh, complete their irradiation, they're transported over to Building 801, which houses our hot cell facility. In the middle picture, you can actually see the linear um, accelerator um, in, that, in that picture. And then at the bottom, you can see some of the hot cells that we use. So this linear accelerator is unique in that it can deliver uh, protons with the incident energies of 66 MeV up to 200 MeV and up to currents up to about 200 microamps. Um, so this is uh, the only facility in the US um, that can do this. And so we can utilize this for producing a number of isotopes. And we can also utilize it for doing radiation damage studies. And this is used to evaluate materials uh, for accelerators or reactors. Now here is, is actually a, a picture um, at the blip facility. And uh, the blip facility consists of, it's a hot cell, as you can see at the top, that sits above a 30-foot shaft. And this shaft is filled with water. And this water is for cooling the targets. It's also actually used for shielding um, the operators from neutrons that come off of those targets. So the targets are actually inserted down into that shaft. And then you can see the Lenac beam comes through and um, performs the target irradiations. And these irradiations can be anywhere from minutes um, up to months at a time. And we, we run what are called stack targets. So the stack targets are arranged such that we have the incident energy coming in. The beam is degraded through the stack to deliver the optimum energy um, to the targets. For protons, there are optimal energies for that beam to go to the nucleus to produce the isotope of interest. So the stack is designed um, to capture um, that optimum energy to produce the isotope of interest. At the top here, you can actually see uh, the hot cell um, at the blip. And so there's a, a door that opens that allows us to insert the targets in and out. And we have a cask that makes up to this to accept those targets and then manipulators here that handle those. So it's really, this was the first facility to design to do this. And it's a, a pretty unique facility. Uh, we did do some upgrades to this facility back in 2016. Uh, prior to this time, the proton beam, um, the only changes we could make to it was really the diameter of the beam on the, on the target. And uh, this results in a, a fair amount of power that was deposited into those targets. So we had to limit the current to ensure um, that the target would survive the irradiations. 
uh, production of isotopes is directly related to the current. And so we wanted um, to increase the current so we could increase the production. As many of the isotopes we produced, there was a higher demand than we could meet. So we installed this raster system, uh, which is, uh, has a series of magnets and the magnets enable us to paint the beam um, on the target. So by doing this, it lowers the power that, the, that is delivered to the target and thereby we were enab enabled to increase the current, thereby increasing the yield. And if you look at the, the picture um, to the right, you can see that the beam distribution without the raster, and you can see the higher power density that is distributed to that, that target. Um, when the raster is in, we actually paint the beam in a circular pattern on the target, um, which dramatically reduced the power and allowed us to um, go up to 165 microamps, which doubled our isotope production. Another thing that we're looking on is actually um, bringing on a low energy cyclotron. And this is for uh, looking at actinium-225 from radium-226, um, but also looking at the production of other diagnostics that we can make at the lower energy region. Uh, we can produce isotopes in the low energy region at the blip, but when we degrade the beam, we get um, beam straggling. And that can often result in the production of, of impurities, um, which we can't get rid of. So by using the low energy cyclotron, we can make some cleaner products at the lower, at lower energies. And this is actually the project that Fumi was working on um, when she was um, working here at the lab. So one of the things that we were interested in was uh, using Fluca um, to look at the doses and the beam energies that we were getting. And so she worked with Joey on Kim on the fluke analysis um, to look at the targets that we were going to put in to basically inform um, what we were going to see um, with the beam came out. And I think they're working on currently at, the, at submitting an article for this. Um, so another um, upgrade we have is, is on the hot cell facilities. Uh, so this is a hot cell that we're working on upgrading that will allow us actually to produce Curie quantities of, of alpha emitters at the facility. Um, so this was an, actually an old hot cell that was used for metallurgic studies. And we needed to upgrade it um, such that the air was clean enough for us to produce isotopes um, for medical applications, but also so that it would allow us um, to introduce them using a different types of casks. So this will increase, um, this gives us three new hot cells, two ready rooms and additional storage. And we're hoping to bring this online this year. So this is a, a, a really increase for us that we're really looking forward to. This will be the first facility at the Department of Energy that can produce Curie quantities of alpha emitters. So I, I wanted to show, so when um, one of the things that, that is a challenge for us is, is the targetry um, that do we develop um, for producing these radioisotopes. And when you're looking at these high energies and targets and you're depositing it into these targets, the challenge is, is doing it in such a way that you don't overheat the target that it, that it really melts through the cans. So there's a lot of thermal analysis that needs to occur um, for us to do this um, um, safely. So here I'm showing, this is a, a scandium target that we irradiate to produce a, a long-lived titanium-44, um, which is of interest for producing scandium-44. And uh, a challenge is what we were looking here is how to uh, raster the beam um, to make sure that we have uh, increased more or less lower the heat that the target material sees. So when we first started doing this, we did a four to one pattern, uh, which you can see here. And one of the challenges is that if you look at the middle of the target, there's a fair amount of heat that's deposited in the middle. Um, so we started looking at uh, changes actually in that raster pattern to see if we could um, minimize the heat load on that target. And so here you can see um, different raster patterns um, that can be delivered um, on that target. And what we observed is that if we went to a 10 to 1 raster pattern, it mitigated the heat that was observed in the middle of that target and, um, and it more or less made it more feasible and would enable us to go up to 300 microns. 
And this is the current raster pattern um, that we're using. So this is a, a, a constant thing that we are working on is um, how to uh, a, more or less increase the current on the targets and make sure that they can survive. This is the Los Alamos facility, um, the IPF, uh, which receives protons from the Lance Accelerator. And the Lance Accelerator, again, is um, used for their um, physics and NSA program. And their facility um, is able to receive 100 MeV incident energy and uh, go up to 250 microns and um, radiate targets. They can radiate about three targets at a time. Um, and again, they run a stacked target array and it allows them to uh, produce um, isotopes similar as to what we see um, at Brookhaven. And here are listed a number of the isotopes. Um, we both can produce neutron fluxes, which we are analyzing now to see if we can produce other isotopes. So at the top, what you can um, actually see is a circle around where the IPF is located to receive um, protons to radiate targets. In the middle is their hot cell facilities. And then at the bottom, what you can see, this is actually a, a rubidium chloride target um, for making strontium-82. In 2017, they actually completed a, a, a project enhancement in which they increased their current and they went from uh, an average of 230 microamps to the ability to go up to 380 microamps. And uh, this project has been completed and they've actually been able uh, to put about 300 microamps um, on a target, which my understanding is now the maximum in the world. So this really allows them um, to produce very high amounts and they're looking on redesigning their target so they can actually go up um, even higher. So Pacific um, PNNL, um, they are they have hot cells and the capability in which they can look at. They actually do extractions of radioisotopes, um, often from waste streams, um, but they also produce uh, generators. And so here you can see their um, at the top their actinide chemistry. They do a lot of automation, so they develop automations that can be used at other facilities. And one of the things that they've been working on is developing automation for Astatine 211. And so they worked with the University of Washington um, to do that. And they've also been developing automation for their generators. Um, so they're, they've been extracting strontium-80, strontium-90, I'm sorry, um, for the use for yttrium-90. And then they, they produce a number of different isotope systems. Uh, additionally, part of the DOE is their reactor sites. There's uh, two main reactors that the isotope program utilizes. Um, one is the high flux isotope or HIFER at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's got the highest flux um, in North America. And uh, they have two ways that they can actually put targets in. Um, so they can insert them um, through the main core, or they actually have a hydraulic tube that they put in that allows them um, to put targets in for um, shorter radiations. And then they have several hot cell facilities. Um, they make things such as California 252 and tungsten 188, um, as well as lutetium 177 and, and, and a number of other isotopes. Then there's the advanced test reactor um, that's used at Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, this reactor is actually owned by the Navy and um, they use it for uh, research and training for um, their Navy ships, but they do allow other things to go on. And um, the, the reactor is used by the isotope program, uh, particularly for um, irradiating to make cobalt 60. And so they make huge amounts of cobalt 60, um, um, which we then sh ship out. Um, they're also looking at um, using it for making iridium uh, 192. So these are the two main reactors that are actually uh, utilized by the isotope program. So one of the, the isotopes recently that came online um, from, from the reactor at Oak Ridge um, was the production of actinium-227. Uh, and actinium-227 is of interest as a generator because it can provide uh, isotopes that can be utilized for um, treating metastatic cancer. And one of the most prevalent is, is radium-223. 
and radium-223 is used as a salt and it, it is taken up quickly by metastatic sites in the bone and um, has, it was approved by the FDA uh, for treating the pain as a palliative treatment for the pain associated with metastatic um, bone cancer. And um, this uh, required that they use uh, radium-226 and they irradiate that um, to produce the actinium-227. Uh, radium-226 uh, used to be used um, as a source for treating uh, metastatic cancer. And uh, many of these uh, sources, and if you look down the line, were developed kind of as seeds that were used um, and put into tumors to irradiate those tumors. So the first thing that Oak Ridge had to do was to take these um, seed materials and more or less extract out the radium-226 and get it into a pure form and then develop a target that they could put into the reactor. Then they had to look at how they could extract the actinium-227 from, from, from the seeds. And uh, this was not a trivial uh, process that they set up, um, but they, this here, you can see this was their first shipment um, that they sent out of this material. They're only one of two producers of this material um, worldwide. So the, the actinium-227 is actually um, used as a generator form that you can um, produce the radium-223. The other thing is that it can provide is uh, an alpha emitter thorium-227. And when thorium-227 decays, it gives off four alpha emissions. And these alpha emissions um, can be used for treating metastatic cancer. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this. So all three of these are produced from this one irradiation and are available. Now, some other programs that, that the isotope program uses um, to supply um, isotopes is Y12. Um, this is a facility that is located actually near Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and they actually provide lithium-6 for neutron detection and lithium-7 for um, dosimeters. And I've already kind of talked to you about um, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, at Los Alamos, they have what's called the plutonium facility. And this is a, a facility that works to extract isotopes from plutonium waste. And one of those is americium-241. And americium-241 is of interest in the oil and gas exploration. And um, they are now the only um, US supplier of americium-241. The Savannah River site provides helium-3, which they extract from the NSA tritium. And they are currently looking at new sources for this. And then a facility that's coming up in the future is called the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams. This is an accelerator um, that is coming online at um, Michigan State University. And there's a program that's being developed under Greg Severin in which he's looking at extracting um, isotopes that are produced in, in their um, beam, both on both the liquid and the gaseous that can then provide um, new isotopes um, into the program. Now, an, an, another thing that is, is of interest for the program is, is developing stable isotopes. Uh, so Oak Ridge used to be uh, one of the key suppliers of stable isotopes. They had a number of calutrons, uh, which they used for years for producing um, a stockpile of stable isotopes. Um, those calutrons um, were, were getting um, old and they actually were shut down. And so for a while, the, the US has not really had a stable um, isotope um, developer. Um, but a few years ago, they started looking at developing new electromagnetic and gas centrifuges, which they could use um, to develop um, stable isotopes. And in 2017, they actually used these to make 500 milligrams of ruthenium-96, uh, which was of interest uh, for BNL because they used it for the RIP program. So they needed this um, target material uh, to radiate to produce that. They're now going on to look at other stable isotopes that are predominantly of interest for the isotope um, program. So this year, they actually um, got significant funding to help build up some of this capability because the um, US is predominantly reliant on Russia for a lot of their stable isotopes. Um, so this will um, help us get out of that situation. 
Now, what a program that's near and dear to my heart is um, looking at um, the alpha emitters, which is, this is kind of why I came to uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. So the actinium-225 is a alpha emitter um, that's of interest for treating um, metastatic cancer. It actually decays, um, giving off uh, four to five alpha emissions, depending on where it goes through the decay scheme. The other reason it's of interest is that you can use it in a generator form and actinium is a parent and then it goes down to uh, bismuth 213. And so you can get the bismuth 213 off, which can be used. The actinium-225 itself has a half-life of 9.92 days. So this enables you to attach it to a variety of antibodies and proteins, which will carry it to metastatic sites, and then it can be used for ablating cancer. The bismuth-213 has a half-life of 46 minutes, and it can be attached to small molecules, and it um, more or less is of interest for treating cancer. The challenge has been that its availability has only been through thorium-229 as a parent, and the thorium-229 was a material that was recovered from uranium-233 waste. And um, it produces about 1,200 millicuries per year. And there are four generators that provide this um, around the world. The biggest generator actually is at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, there's a generator that's located in Germany, one in Russia, and recently about a three millicurie generator came on at um, Canadian National Laboratories. The challenge is, is that the, although this is, might be enough for researchers, it's not enough to actually get us into um, preclinical and clinical studies. So we've been looking at ways that we can increase the amount of actinium-225 to allow for clinical evaluations and for drug development. And so we looked at an, a number of routes of production, and the only one that really gets you into that realm is using the high energy accelerator routes uh, for, for, for actually producing this. Now, if you, you can see here that in the left-hand corner, there's a, a picture of a patient. And uh, the reason, and this just kind of shows you why people are so interested in this. And this is a, a patient um, who has metastatic um, prostate cancer. And so the patient was imaged um, initially with something called GAIM-68 PSMA. PSMA is a small molecule that was designed such that it is um, taken up by metastatic prostate cancer in very high quantities. So it allows you um, to image the sites of metastatic prostate cancer and to really quantitate um, the uptake there. And so they did the initial image of this patient who was enrolled in a clinical trial in Germany and was to be treated with uh, Rutesium-177, which is a beta emitter. And when they imaged this patient, what they saw is that all these black spots are metastatic cancer except for the kidneys. Um, and you could see a high amount of uptake actually in the bone. And if they treated this patient with Lutetium, which is a beta emitter and has a, a large energy, a large range that it travels, it basically would have ablated this patient's bone marrow and the patient would not have survived the treatment. So they decided to switch the patient over to actinium-225. Alpha emitters have a very short range um, that they travel, so this, this would not ablate um, this patient's bone marrow, and they can deliver a much higher dose than, than the betas. And so what you can see here is in the middle picture, um, this is a, again a gallium-68 image. You can see just the huge response that this patient had to this um, treatment. And at the bottom, you can see the PSA values, and there's a significant drop in the PSA value after three treatments. They gave the patient additional treatment with the PSMA and the PSA value was 0.1. So this patient completely responded. And uh, this is a patient that didn't, hadn't really responded to anything else. So the- So, DOE, so Kathy, can you, can you explain a little bit about the PSA? How is that significant to show that the person is doing well? So the, the PSA is basically a marker for prostate cancer. And so it's, it's a blood test. And um, when, when a person has uh, prostate cancer, those values go up. So when you saw in the initial image, that patient had a PSA value of around 3000. 
And you can see that when they had treatment, it, it dropped off. And so when you get to point one, um, the value is so low that you consider that patient a complete responder. Does that help? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so the Department of Energy for the TriLab effort um, based on the um, looking at the high energy accelerators um, that could be used to produce actinium from bombarding thorium-232 targets. And Oak Ridge has had a lot of experience with actinium-225. So they join and help um, developing the chemistry for processing um, these targets. And we're at the point now where this is actually being provided and we have a, um, the regulations in, in place for people to use it uh, for clinical trials. And here you see Jason Aleppa, who works at Brookhaven, uh, loading the targets into the box that actually um, goes down into the blip. So initial challenge with this is that uh, we were looking at thorium-232. This is a high energy spallation reaction. In order to produce actinium this way, you need energies above 90 MeV. And um, one of the challenges is that when you hit these targets with these high energies and currents, it can cause the thorium to heat up to the point that it can actually melt through the cans. Um, the other challenge was really understanding, since this is a spallation reaction, it means it makes a lot of things. So we had to initially um, do uh, reactions looking at thorium foils and foils to monitor the current so we could determine what the cross sections were of the materials we were going to make so we could understand the chemistry for extracting the actinium, but also so we could understand our waste streams. What you see in the middle is actually the target that we um, have developed um, and are currently using for producing the actinium-225. Um, you can see that the target, we actually cut the thorium up into pie-sized pieces. Um, this allows us to extract it um, from the can, and then we ship it to Oak Ridge that currently is doing the processing. But it took us a lot of work to figure out how to um, load the thorium and design the can such um, so that we could mitigate the heating of the target and ensure that it would um, survive the irradiations. And Brookhaven is now at the point that we've developed a target that we can go up to 105 grams, um, which allows us to produce the Curie quantities of actinium-225. Um, now, the other challenge um, with this is actually the chemistry of extracting the actinium-225. So since this is a spallation reaction, that means we produce um, over 400 other isotopes um, in addition to the actinium-225. Um, and um, it wasn't clear that we were going to be able to um, isolate the actinium-225 um, from this target material in a clean enough form um, that you can actually use it in patients, uh, particularly because we produce a lot of lanthanides and lanthanides um, had the same charge and were close to the same size as the, as the actinium. So this, this is um, kind of how we first started this process. And uh, what we initially did is we did um, an extraction trying to extract the highest dose um, isotopes from the thorium target. We would then go on to isolate the actinium-225 from thorium and some of the other isotopes. And then we had other um, column separations that we did to do a final um, extraction and cleanup of the actinium-225. And we've done comparison studies to show that the actinium-225 that we actually get from this route is very similar to that from the thorium-229 generator. Um, but it's a fairly extensive process for doing this. Um, in addition to, to this material, we're also looking at other, mount, other ways of um, producing the actinium-225. Um, so they're looking at it on the electron accelerator at Argonne, um, starting with the radium-226 target. Um, at Brookhaven, we're, we're working with radium-226 on our small cyclotron. And then Oak Ridge is looking at um, trying to produce it through thorium-229. The challenge is that the thorium-229 can only make um, actually small amounts because it's a, a 3N gamma reaction. Um, so some other isotopes we're look, looking at is copper-67. Um, we can make copper-67 at Brookhaven, um, but they can also make it cleaner and in um, higher specific activity at um, Argonne National Laboratory. This is Dave Roche 
um, and he's um, putting a target into the leaf accelerator. And they're now at the point where they're looking at making um, true curie batches. And copper 67 is of interest. Um, it's one of the isotopes that looks like from a beta emitter, it can deliver um, higher doses. And there's actually a drug approved uh, with dotatate for treating actually metastatic neural endocrine tumors. There's a number of different therapeutic isotopes that, that we're looking at um, and trying to increase the use of isotopes for therapy. Uh, one of the advantages of using isotopes um, for therapies that based on their half-life, um, they only have a short period of time that they deliver their dose, they then decay away and um, there's no more toxicity. And this is very different from other drugs that are, that are used. So a lot of times for chemotherapy, the challenge is, is that you give gram quantities of these drugs and uh, some of the toxic side effects are such that it limits the amount that you can give. So radionuclides actually have a real advantage and uh, we're working on um, some additional um, generator systems um, to deliver these for treating these cancers. And then lutetium-177, this is uh, one that's um, one that I had actually worked on. It's been a large part of my career developing. And there's two ways you can produce it. One is uh, through the direct method in which you irradiate lutetium-176 to get lutetium-177. And this gives you a specific activity about 20 curies per milligram. Um, but we further developed um, indirect routes in which you can radiate a terbium 176. It produces a terbium 177, which decays to lutetium. And this gives you material um, with about 100 um, curies per milligram. So much, much higher specific activities. The lutetium is of interest because it has a smaller beta particle range. And it turns out that that combined uh, with some of the conversion electrons has been shown to give higher doses and to be less toxic um, than some of the other uh, radio metals that have been used. So in summary, um, hopefully you can see here that the DOE is um, continuing um, to invest in its facilities and, and uh, bringing up both stable and um, nuclear isotopes that are of, of interest. We have increased our facilities by adding additional rastering and increasing our current, what is, which is helping us to um, produce even higher amounts of radionuclides to produce. And then we've done a lot of work um, on targetry and the targetry is really challenging due to the amount of power that we're depositing into these targets. And we are increasing our production facilities um, to enable us to produce the isotopes in quantity sufficient enough for um, people to actually use. And um, I'm, I'm just here giving you this talk, but there's a lot of people who were involved in these programs. And um, these are some of the key people who have really um, helped with a lot of the actinium work that, that I talked about here today. And um, I'm just giving the talk, but a lot of them have really been the ones that have made this possible. And based on that, I'm, I would be happy to answer any questions um, that you may have um, based on this work or anything else in regards to the, the isotope programs at DOE. Uh, Kathy, thank you very much. This is uh, nice and very comprehensive and uh, it's great to see how rich the program is across the country and that uh, DOE is uh, really putting a lot of effort uh, to, to make sure that the program grows. Um, so, um, so, so there are some of our alumni in medical physics and uh, are interested in, in, in what you have to say. So I, I expect that people will, will have talk, I mean, questions or comments. Uh, hi, Justina, can you, can you talk or you? you... Um, so, Kathy, I think now you can see the chat. There is uh, a question from uh, Justina. She was one of our uh, students in ASP 2014 in, 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 in Senegal. And uh, she has gone on to get her PhD in medical physics. She's originally from Nigeria. Um, so, she has to explain part, the part where you said that uh, actinium-225 is clinically insignificant. 
Um, so I didn't mean to say it was insignificant. Um, I meant to say that it was clinically significant. Um, so the there's there's a lot of interest in, in alpha emitters for um, two reasons. One is that they, the, the lower toxicity that you see from them. So for, for radiotherapy, what has mostly been looked at are, are beta particle emitters. And um, that's been because they've been the ones that are most easily available in high quantities. A challenge with the beta particle emitters is that they can travel um, long distances. So, um, and that means that they can be delivered to the tumor, but often they travel outside of the tumor and they deliver dose to normal tissues. And that toxicity um, can result in you not being able to give enough to actually re reach um, levels that are like what you can get with the alpha emitters. So with the alpha emitters, you can deliver them to the site, it decays and the dose actually remains in the tumor. Um, so this allows you to get the complete responses um, that I showed you and the image that I gave you. So that, that's why there's um, interest in this. So I, I'm sorry if, if I um, miscorrectly said insignificant, it's actually clinically significant. Okay, um, other questions, um, other comments? So, uh, Kathy, I think it was on page 35, uh, okay. Jesus. Yes, uh, Meiki. Um, a question? Uh, uh, who has a question? Justina. Justina, okay, you have another question? Yeah, you see on that place, if you can go back to the slide, I just need more explanation about that part on the slide. Uh, on the actinium-225? Yes. So what is it you want me There's to something say? something he said I didn't quite understand. So I, she, said, she said she said she can go back to that part of that slide when you just discuss the actinium-225. Um, let's see. Um, I'm looking at it, but I, I'm not sure what she's referring to. Do you remember the page number? That page I said. Oh, okay. I see what she's talking about. Yeah. So what she's, okay. I didn't really explain this. That's a good point. So when we, when we make the actinium-225, um, using thorium-232 at high energies. Um, what, one of the, the additional challenges that we make is that we produce actinium-227. And, and, it's, and it's in quantities um, of about 0.02%. And so the actinium-227 has a long half-life. And so there was some concerns that that 227 um, might lead to additional dose or toxicity to the patients. So we did studies using molecules to look at what the impact of that actinium-227 content is. And what the dos dosimetry and toxicity showed is that the amounts were so little that it was really insignificant. And so it was really the 227 um, that's insignificant, its presence being in the 225. Um, so that's what I was referring to. Thanks for pointing that out. I didn't really discuss that when I gave the talk. Does that make sense? Justina, is that clarifying the, the question? It's okay, so although the, it, uh, the, my internet was uh, shaking, so I could not hear her clearly, but it's okay, no problem. Okay. Um, so is the actinium 227 uh, that is who's present uh, or contamination in the 225 that is insignificant? That's the bottom line. Yes. So it's when you, a lot of times when you're making um, isotopes, unless, unless you're making them indirectly, there, there are impurities that are there. And one of the things you have to be concerned about is what is the impact of those impurities? Mm -hmm. um, so we often look at those when we develop them um, to make sure that, that, that it doesn't have a significant impact. Yeah. 
Uh, Meiki, you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, I would appreciate if you can give us um, an idea about the quantities that uh, they are being produced for those, uh, or for some of the isotopes. Yeah, and it, so it, it can depend on um, whether the isotope is actually used for um, imaging. For, for, for or, example, for the medical purposes. Yes. Um, so it, it can depend on whether the, the isotope is being developed for imaging or therapy. So for imaging, we use um, much smaller amounts than what we actually do um, for therapy. So for, for therapy, for instance, if you're, if you're gonna use something like lutetium-177, um, they can be delivering up to 200 millicuries in a single dose to the patient. So in that case, they're having to make um, hundreds of curies of lutetium in order to support the clinical trials. Now, when you look at, at the alpha emitters like the actinium um, that I was talking about here, the amounts that you deliver are, are far less um, because they're, they're more, um, the dose that you get is um, higher than what you get for, for the beta emitters. Um, so in this case, what we're really looking at in order to um, to support um, the initial trials is that we would probably need to, to make like 10 curies um, to actually support what's needed worldwide. And at the maximum, you might get up to um, 100 curies. Does that help? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we have some guests here from uh, Itamba Lab, uh, uh, Dr. Joel Mira. He's uh, an accelerator physicist at Itamba Lab in South Africa. Um, they also produce, I understand, uh, radio isotopes for, for medical application. I'm not sure, uh, Joely, I'm not sure. Do you want to do you want to comment or do you want to give us some perspective from South Africa? Um, okay, so while we are waiting from him, uh, if, if he wants to say something, I just want to acknowledge him in case he wants to, uh, he wants mm. to uh, say something. Um, other people have questions or comments? Joely, do you want to say something? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I don't have much to say, but uh, I saw your email concerning this uh, uh, talk. I thought maybe there will be some uh, technical uh, designing of, especially of the beamline, because I'm working on the designing of the new beamline that we will be using. Uh, the production of the SAFE, uh, the project that we are running now, we are uh, busy procuring a 70 MeV cyclotron from IBA, and we have designed, uh, we are busy with the design of the targets that we will be using for this uh, uh, The targets that we are designing, we are hoping that they will be able to uh, um, We've stand uh, 350 microamps of uh, 70 MeV protons um, <clears throat> because uh, the target that we have at the moment in our facility, it can withstand up to 250 microamps. So I had to keep talking about the rasters. So I wanted to uh, know exactly how do they switch on the target to reduce uh, heat that is building up uh, due to the uh, beam on the target because uh, for the it made from the ferrite magnet uh, ferrite core because uh, if you are going to sweep the beam at uh, about one kilohertz or three kilohertz, you are going to generate a lot of uh, eddy current uh, which will uh, uh, counteract your fields uh, that you want to use in order for you to sweep the beam on the target. 
So I, I'm not sure that I understand what your question is. Can you? Yeah, the, yeah it was. Because you were kind of cutting in and out. Yeah. yeah. My question is uh, based on the the beam on the target in order to choose the heat spot on the target. Do you know the specification of uh, the magnet you use in order for you to shift the beam on the target, or how do you do? Do you move the target, or you move the beam on the target? So there, basically, we have magnets in both the vertical and horizontal, and the magnet okay. basically moves the beam um, in a pattern on the target. So what we have chosen to do is we move it in a circular pattern. So we do two circles basically on the target. Um, I know at Los Alamos, they have a raster and they do concentric circles from the outside to the inner part of the, of the target. Does that help answer your question? Yes and no. Now, I just wanted to find out the application of uh, the it seems uh, you are not, uh, you don't have that uh, information about the magnet, what they uh, are designed and uh, see that they are using to shift the beam on the magnet. It's the required to, uh, yeah. because you say that you have two, where the way you are sweeping it, you are sweeping it uh, using two different uh, uh, sweeping radius. So that means what I understand is that you will have to vary your magnetic field <coughs> so that you sweep uh, like that. So I wanted to know the field that is being used uh, to sweep this. Uh, yeah. So what I can yeah. tell you is um, I would suggest there was a, there's a manuscript that came out on this actually in 2017 um, on how we implemented the raster beam and designed it. Um, so I would suggest that you go out. Leonard Mausner is the first author on that paper. And I think okay. be in, that, in that paper. Okay. Well, and no. so come, come to Brookhaven and visit us. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, other, other people have uh, questions or comments? So I saw that someone asked about training opportunities in the isotope laboratories. And uh, we have lots of opportunities for students um, to come and work with us and even faculty. Um, so you, for instance, Fumi came, I think she worked with us for six months and uh, she came and worked with us on the, on the cyclotron project. Uh, but if you're interested, um, I, I guess reach out to us um, we would be, we're more than happy we take on, right now we're, it's a little strange because of COVID, but um, we have students that we are working with right now that are doing our fluca and ANSYS analysis of our targets. Um, we had a couple students uh, last summer that were working on targetry. So we are open to have some people come and work with us. Christine? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So sorry, I connected a bit late, so I couldn't see the full presentation, but this is very important, Getty, what you have been showing. So my question would be maybe more general because I come from Fermilab, so for years as well, there have been as well all the different treatment with radioisotope, but the, the adrenal therapy. So now it has been quite few years, but then there were so many patients as well that were uh, capable to be treated. I remember, I mean, it was thousands of people per year. So is there any kind of respect as well that a laboratory like BNL will have as well this, not a monopoly, but the capacity really to, to, to have um, the large demand as well of patients be treated? Or do you think that there could be as well some, some synergy as well with industry or, or some kind of um, novel technique development that would give possibility as well for, for um, I mean, uh, even easier use as well of the, the adron therapy or any type of treatment. Is there any kind of political development as well that DOE is looking at to not only keep it within the DOE, but potentially defining something that could be commercialized? Yeah, and I mean, so I, I'm not an expert in, in the hadron that you're asking about. 
Um, but I can tell you that at, at BNL, they are working on um, accelerator designs to help with this. And they're working with industry to do that. Um, the DOE has a lot of interest in developing technology that they hand off to the commercial sector. Um, and so many of the, the isotopes even that we produce, we produce here and then the commercial sector is able to make them and we hand it off and go off to do something else. Um, so um, I, like I said, I'm not an expert in hadron, but I know that we are um, working with companies to develop um, novel accelerator designs to try to help with that. Excellent, that's really important, good, good to know that. Yeah. So Cathy, could you comment a little bit on the stable isotopes? Um, the, what is the big interest in, in those? Uh, the, is that for diagnostics or the, probably not for therapy, right? Uh, what, what's the interest for the stable one? Um, I, I would say there's various interest in the stable isotopes so that they're the targets basically that you irradiate for instance. Um, and there's interest in them for the physics programs because they, they need it for their targets, um, but also for isotope production. We need the stable enriched um, target material in order to produce the isotopes. And uh, so there was a, a big stockpile um, that was developed at Oak Ridge and, they, and now many of those isotopes have been used up. So if you're wanting to get them, the only place you can actually order them from is actually getting them uh, from Russia. So we're, we're, we're dependent on Russia for many of these. So that's why the isotope program started up the stable program um, so that they can produce these quantities um, so that we can use them for um, isotope production, um, but also for the physics programs. Um, so there's a lot of, of different uses of these stable isotopes. Okay, thanks. Um, other, other people have questions, uh, comments? So, um, uh, Kathy, could you also comment? I know you have been uh, making a, a lot of efforts to develop programs that will include developing countries. And I think you have some Ooh. programs now to reach out to some countries in Africa and, and get them involved in, 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 in a, an international collaboration. Um, could you just tell us a little bit uh, how that is going and, 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 and how you see the future of that uh, coming up? Yeah, so the, um, the NNSA uh, was interested in, in trying um, to provide grants to do um, peaceful use for nuclear. And they were particularly interested in trying to um, help countries develop their um, nuclear medicine capabilities. And uh, so we had written a grant and, a, and we got the funding um, to, try, to try to help do that. Um, when we originally applied for the grant, um, we are, we thought that uh, what they were gonna do was to allow us um, to go out and pick the partners that we were going to work with. Um, but it turns out that they have chosen um, the two sites that they want us to work with. And what we're hoping is that um, we can um, eventually expand beyond that to try to do training. Um, but the two countries that they have chosen is for us to work with uh, Ghana and Sierra Leone um, to try to work with them to help um, increase their training for doing um, nuclear medicine. And this is actually through the Society of Nuclear Medicine um, and Molecular Imaging in the US. Okay, no, that's good. I think that's definitely a great start, yeah. Um, and, well, I think and that, um, yeah, I, I mean, originally what we were hoping is, we kind of started this before COVID-19 and we were hoping that we could um, kind of send people out, but that's obviously not going to happen. Mm. Um, so probably we're going to have to do develop courses online. And our hope is that by um, working with these two in the IAEA, um, that eventually these can be expanded to be um, courses that can be used by other countries as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, other people have uh, other questions, uh, other comments?
So, um, since uh, people are not are not asking questions, then uh, I just want to say that uh, thank you for for uh, having just to fool me last year uh, at BNL to to work with you and your group. Um, so she's of uh, of African School of Physics edition of 2018 in, in, in Namibia. So she was a part of the nine ASP alumni that spent uh, three to six months at BNL in 2019. So one of them worked with Cathy in her group. And I think she mentioned, Cathy mentioned that uh, they are working on the paper right now. So, uh, and uh, so that, that was really a great help to, for you to provide funding and assistance and coaching and now we, we really want to develop that sort of partnership and uh, collaboration and you know, how to bring uh, African student alumni to, to uh, programs that are sponsored by DOE and, and BNL. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we would love to sponsor more. Yeah. I mean, Fumi was, um, she was incredible, very bright, worked really hard, got a lot of data out. Um, it was really a joy to work with her. I'm actually hoping that she may decide to come back. Yeah, so, which, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also I think when hopefully next year we will have the in-person African School of Physics, and and we hope that uh, we will have you in person uh, to to lecture to the students. And so uh, once. Uh, the situation seem under control. We'll try to see when, when we can reset the date, and, yeah. and hopefully you will come back to the school. Well, I, I just want to thank you for giving students an opportunity during this time. Um, I know it's really hard with COVID, um, but um, I hope you all hang in there, and um, hopefully in the future we'll see each other in person. And um, if you're I guess interested in any opportunities we have, feel free to reach out to me. Yeah. Um, one thing as well, Cathy, some of the students ask uh, if we can get your slide uploaded to the agenda page. Sure, I can do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, or you can send it to me and then I will put it up. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, anybody has any last minute question or any other comments? Or... Uh, there is a comment in here. Okay. I just would like to uh, thank you for um, uh, for the nice lecture, Prof. And it's really um, very informative to me. So I, I learned a lot, actually. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad you got Excellent. what you did. Thank you. Okay, so um, I would like to thank Cathy again for uh, uh, for 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 being available to lecture to us. And Caitlin, thank you for arra the arrangement. Uh, it's all very nice. And uh, I would like to thank all the people who were uh, who are attended today. And uh, if you want to reach out to Cassie, I think you have the her information. It's on the agenda page. And uh, so um, if there are no other comments or question, questions, then I would suggest that we stop here okay. for today. Thank you all. Yeah. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.